Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. It is good to be with you all this day. Just a few announcements for the group. You'll see up here we have a bunch of Bibles. Um, If you have a child that has, when they were baptized, did not receive a Spark Bible, feel free to grab one. If, um, If you have a third grader in your family, they can grab the Spark NRSV Bible. If your child is ready for confirmation class, they can grab one of those gray Bibles, collaborate Bibles with a small catechism. And if you're an adult who needs a Bible, you can grab one of the red ones there and pick one of them up as well. There's also a bunch of... I'm not saying this because you all are older and don't get on me about that. Uh, there are some large print ones in the chapel. I know it says Zion's Daughters, but... I've checked, you're, you're good to take them. I'd rather the Bibles be used than sit on a bookshelf. So, and I would greatly appreciate, I would love to sell, go all, the, all these Bibles disappear and I have to go buy more Bibles and tell council that we need to increase the budget for that. So if your Bible's falling apart, you want a, nice, a new one, you can grab one there too. Let's see. Tonight at 6.30 p.m., Women's Bible Study is happening at the Valley Hope Farm. The weather is uh, so-so they're going to move into the garage so they'll be nice and warm in there too. So um, that's at 6.30 tonight. Tomorrow night, um, the next cycle of grief share starts at 6 p.m. Um, council is at 6.30 p.m. down in the social room. On Wednesday, we are um, trying to do um, a weekday Bible study with you all. Um, we have two times you can come at 6.30 a.m. and at 6.30 p.m. We don't know what it's going to look like, uh, or we know what we're going to be looking at the, the topic is on the Sunday lessons coming up. Um, we're not really sure about how people are, how participation is going to work. We'll readjust as we go from there, and that's okay. Uh, but look, there's information in your bulletin about the Bible study, um, and we look forward to having you. Let's see. And then next Sunday, a um, couple things. There is noisy change offering, which is benefiting Lutheran disaster relief, followed by, um, there's also the start of Sunday school classes and adult form. There is a class for everybody, and if you just simply need to come and drink some coffee and take a break from the world, we have that in the library too. So uh, details about that are in your bulletin. Um, Coming up um, on September 23rd is Heritage Day. we, the kitchen committee needs a bunch of baked goods. What we really need is, um, um, we also need volunteers to help man our booth. The t- uh, we just need some good representative, representatives of Zion, uh, of our church, so that we can greet people and talk about our church and our faith community here. Um, there is a sign up for a schedule at the same place where you sign up for your desserts. And I would really love to see that, that half of that filled up today. So. Um, there's your challenge for the day. If you can help at any at all for that, we would greatly appreciate it. Coming up um, on September 25th, we have a day off uh, program scheduled. It's the only one we could really make work for this fall. Um, we are, so we're going all out. We're going down to the Spy Museum um, down in Washington, D.C. We have a limited amount of space for only about 28 kids at the most um, to go. But I need to know, have an RSVP by, by Tuesday, September 12th. So if you have a child, a neighbor, a, a grandkid, any that might be interested in this, um, go to our website, click on the Youth and Family Ministry tab, click on the Day Off program, or just scroll down the page. You'll see the registration button. Click on that. Register there. If you can't figure that out, just, just send me an email. Call me. But it needs, I need to know by Tuesday so that I can make sure that we have enough space reserved for us to go. And it's open to elementary, middle, and high schoolers to come. So um, look for that. There's also uh, outside, there's a bulletin board about apple butter. There are all the details for apple butter this year. Apple butter is back, by the way, is in your bulletin. So please do read that at your convenience. Are there any other announcements for the good of the community? One thing about our service, you'll notice that we have switched to, from setting 10, which is a good service liturgy setting to do in the summer. Um, we have switched back to 
setting um, four of the ELW um, for this for the next few months. So just be aware there are some changes there. I invite you to stand then for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus, who bears across the spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sins. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others, for the harm we have caused, known and unknown. Forgive us for the unjust demands we place on others in your creation. Forgive us. The ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved, in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making us, making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Let us stand, remain standing and sing together hymn 835. 835.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. peace in the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Heaven. be with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us towards all that gives life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Y'all may be seated for the lesson. Good morning. Our first reading comes from the Old Testament chapter of Ezekiel, verses 33, chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. Now I have to admit, this first part of the reading, it's kind of a downer. But luckily we have a second part. So you mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning for me. If I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? And say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? The word of the Lord. We will read responsibly the psalm, Psalm 119. 
beginning at verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for that is my desire. Turn my eyes from beholding falsehood. Give me life in your way. Turn away the reproach that I dread, because your judgments are good. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. The member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Christ. You all may be seated. When I say the word catechism, I, what's one of the, what are the thoughts that come to your mind? Is it the three-hour classes that you are forced to sit in Pastor Hoover's home or Pastor Turley's home, walking uphill both ways in the snow, even in the summertime? You all picture the orange and red small catechism that could fit in your, in your breast pocket. Do you all remember them? Right? Do you, when I say catechism, do you think of dread or do you think of happy thoughts? And I think if you think of happy thoughts, you probably wouldn't be sitting in the pews right now. You'd be standing in one of these pulpits. But, I mean, although looking back, I don't know if I really enjoyed catechism all that much, although I did. It's a weird thing. It was a weird time to be a teenager and learning about Jesus, right? A lot of us remember confirmation as a time when you had to stand in front of people and publicly say parts of the the catechism that you had to memorize, right? I think most of the today, though, after we finish confirmation, we, we probably haven't picked up that little book since then, right? Which is a shame. And something that the church is actively trying to change. Back in 2017, at the, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, the Lutheran Church, we did a major push to put the catechism back into the vernacular, back into our daily devotional text, as it was intended by Luther to be, a daily devotional text. We not only reprinted it, which are up here, we also made it available for free online. In app stores, you can download the small catechism and put it on your phone and read it wherever you like. The small catechism is it's a great it's a great thing, and it's not just a medieval torture device that we use for confirmating students, right? In this little book, holds a lot holds a very simple understanding of our faith. I mean, Luther wrote it. For his three-year-old son, who's running around the house asking, Daddy, what is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? Why, 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 why? That's what three-year-olds do, right? He wrote it for a three-year-old, right? It's a very basic understanding of the Christian faith. 
the small catechism begins with a discussion of the law. And now Luther, when he was putting together the small catechism, he could have chose a whole bunch of different laws to choose from. There are 613 laws in the Old Testament. He could have put them all in the, in the small catechism. Then it wouldn't be small, but he could have picked whatever he wanted. But instead, he chose to pick the very basic Ten Commandments to talk to, to, talk to kids and adults, too, about the law. And eventually in this case, he goes into the gospel. One of the things we always point out to confirmands when looking at the Ten Commandments is looking at the number of how many of the commandments talk about, are about between us and God, laws about us and how we're supposed to interact with God and God's interact with us, and how many laws are guarding how we're to interact with each other. Anybody know the answer? How many, how many of the Ten Commandments deal between us and God, how many deal between each other? How many? I heard six. You're off by one. Seven. Seven deal between us, three are between us and God. Seventy percent of the law is all about how we're supposed to interact with each other. Thirty percent deals with how we're supposed to interact with God. Right? God is more concerned about how you and I get along rather than how we get along with God. And of course, on the surface, if we were to read the, the, the Ten Commandments straight through with no explanation, it sounds like, you know, we're doing pretty good, especially those seven that deal between us and, and our, our neighbors. I mean, how many of us could read and just say, well, I haven't killed anyone lately. I haven't had an extramarital affair. I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't told a lie to harm someone else. And, and, and to be honest with you, my stuff is nicer than my neighbor, so why should I even bother coveting what they have? And if we're on the subject of coveting, why does it even matter? So I like nice things. Sue me, right, God? But that isn't so for Luther. Luther explains, in, for example, in the fourth commandment, that it's not just about honoring your father and your mother. It includes those in authority. And so when we do show or do anything that does not involve honor, serve, obey, love, and respect anyone in authority, including political leaders who we might not always agree with, we say horrible things about them. We don't like the past and we say, oh, he's just, a, he's just a moron. They're an authority over us. Teachers, principals, the whole life. We break the fourth commandment. You know, we might not actively go out with a knife and try to stab someone. But unless we help and support our neighbor, and Jesus is very clear about who our neighbor is. It's not just those who live next to us. Unless we help and support our neighbor in all of life's needs, we murder them. We kill them. So every time you are on Bucky Sunpite and you're trying to get on the 70, and there's those panhandlers in, on the sidewalk and in the median trying to get some help, and you do nothing for them, you are actively murdering them. And I don't care if you have all the, all the excuses in the world saying, well, they're just going to use it on drugs. And I don't care. And in Hagerstown, I, this is a whole other sermon for another day. But I am so annoyed. They put up these signs that say, why panhandling is banned? But they won't help the panhandlers, right? Which makes absolutely no sense. You spend all this money on, on signs, but you want to help the people who need it. You know, we can say all we want about panhandling and all the goods and bad, all that stuff. But if we don't help our neighbors in need, we are actively murdering them, according to Luther's Catholicism. Every time you have traded in that plunker of a car to try to get a better one, you don't tell the dealer everything that's wrong with it because you want to get it more for your trade-in, you are breaking the seventh commandment. God is very much concerned about how we treat one another because God knows it is harder to repair human relationships than it is to repair divine relationships. Maintaining human relationships is one of the hardest things we do. It's one of the many tasks that I do as a pastor. Leading the flock sometimes means mediating concerns and disagreements among community members. Because there is value in maintaining this kind of community. There is power in having this kind of a community. For starters, our community is grounded in the hope of the resurrection. No other community has that hope. Go to your next HOA meeting and see how many people talk about the resurrection. Right? They're going to talk to you about your friends not being the right color before they talk to you about Jesus, right? Go to your next PTA meeting and tell me how many times the resurrection is said. Instead, they're going to tell you, you know, how many times have you, like, 
can you, can you sell more Joe Corby's pizza? That's what they're more concerned with. They're not concerned about the resurrection. If God didn't want us Christians to live together, Jesus would never have established the church. He simply would have died on the cross 2,000 years ago as an atonement for our sins and nothing more. He never would have spent the time to get 12, 12 disciples together. He never would have spent the time to attract large crowds of people and to tell them about God's love for them. He would never have said things like, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The church is important to Jesus. But Jesus is not a fool. He knows that problems and conflicts will arise from time to time in the church. I mean, he saw this with his very 12 chosen disciples. In Matthew 18, verses 1 to 4, Jesus overhears his disciples arguing over who is the greatest. In John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, Judas argues with Mary because Mary has decided to use a bottle of costly perfume to anoint the feet of Jesus, telling her that it would have been better for her to sell that perfume and give the money to the poor. Conflicts among members happens. So Jesus gave us a step-by-step -step guide of how we should deal with that when they do occur. In fact, if you were to go and look up chapter 15 of our Constitution, actually of any ELCA Constitution, it says prior to disciplinary action and rec reconciliation and repentance will be attempted following Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Chapter 15 of our Constitution, which is concerning discipline among church members, can only be instituted if Matthew 18, 15 to 17 has already been done and failed. But how often do we, we do what Matthew 18 says? How many of us, when another member of our community does something wrong, go and talk directly to that person? So most of the time, we fire up the phone tree, right? And talk to everybody else about that person we have an issue with. We never confront the individual we feel has wronged us. We'll send anonymous feedback and complaints to church leadership in the hopes that they'll just sort it out, right? Imagine if instead of complaining to others about someone else, we go and talk to that person they're with. Imagine all the problems and conflicts that have happened over the years in the church. Imagine if we would have just talked to one another directly, face to face. Imagine how differently our community would be. I mean, look at any comment section online, and you will find some of the rudest people in the world, right? But it, most of the time, if you meet those people in the world, they're very kind and sweet people. But their online persona has them very rude. Why is that? Or, or road rage. Like, when we're in a car, like, my bottom orient shows right? You cut me off, man, you better, better pay for it. You're going to pay for it, right? My, my inner bottom orient really shows at that point, right? Why is that? Studies have shown that it's because there are a barrier in between us. So online, there's a computer screen and monitor that separates us from the other individual, right? And so we have no filter in that case, right? We can say whatever we want because we don't have to worry about looking in the, in the eye and seeing the, the sorrow and the sadness from our words hurting them. When we're inside of a car, we're shielded by a giant metal box, right? And because of this giant metal box, we tend to be a little bit more mean, right? Notice, you know, say you're sitting in traffic, right? And you're trying to, and all these people keep cutting you off. And you say, I'm not going to let another single person come into my lane. I am not going to. And then this person looks at you in the eye and says, hey, can I merge over? How many of us say, yep, go ahead. Even though we just said, I'm not letting another person merge in front of me, right? When people face each other and look each other in the eye, things tend to de-escalate, right? Jesus wants us to confront those who have made mistakes so that we can, not so that we can expose them and, and then throw them out of the community, but so that we can settle our differences, offer forgiveness, and move on. But there are times when the accuser might be wrong. Right? And that's why Jesus says, if, if you're not listened to, take one or two others along with you so, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And this is really done for two reasons. One, it's so that you indeed do have witnesses if things do continue to escalate from here. 
but they also serve as a check against your argument. Did that individual actually wrong you, or did you perceive it as a wrong? The two or three others will help you gauge the truth. Eventually, if that person is indeed in the wrong and won't listen to reason at any level, sometimes the only course of action to save the community is to ask that person to leave. Church word for that is excommunication. And it should always be a means of last resort. But it sometimes has to be done. Because this isn't your church or my church. This is Christ's church. This is Christ's community. And if someone is hurting Christ's community, Christ's church, they are like a cancer and need to be removed. And it's not to say that everything will be fine and dandy after we remove that person. Because conflict still drives people, other people away, unintended victims. So you've really got to ask yourself, is this really worth the fight? Is it really worth it? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But I think the most important thing to take away from this process that Jesus lines out for us in Matthew 18 is that anonymous feedback has no place in the church. We do things in the open, not in secret. If you have a problem with someone in church, you go and talk to them face to face. Hiding behind a screen, a pen, or others, and forcing others to fix your broken relationship is not the Christian way. That is not the Christ way of doing it. Church is a beautiful, messy place. It's a beautiful, messy group of people who come together to support one another and grow in faith, and most importantly, to have Christ present among us. It is hard work to maintain the community, and it's hard, made harder when we put our own needs, desires, and wants ahead of the mission of the gospel. But we must commit ourselves to this important holy work because Christ is present. Christ is watching us. Would Jesus approve of what we are doing, of what we are saying, of how we're treating one another? You know, heard it said that when the cat's away, the mice will play. Well, our cat never left. It's just sitting up top on the bookshelf watching us. Are you okay with what he's witnessing? You know, I'm not naive to think that, you know, one sermon is just going to fix all of our broken relationships, fix all of our problems, so I hope that we can use Jesus' words from Matthew 18 and create a theological framework that will serve as a guide as we navigate and live as a people of God. You know the, the Sunday school rhyme? The, uh, I always do this wrong. Here's a church, here's a steeple, open the door. Yeah, I can never do it. And see all the people? That is the best way to describe church. It's the people of God. The church is not a building, but it's a gathering of the saints. It's the people of God. May we tend to the relationships of this community just as much as we tend to things like planning worship services, of planning educational ministries, of caring and maintaining our beautiful campus. May we tend to the task of caring and forgiving one another. Let us stand and sing him 716.
We respond to the word of God by confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, for all creation, and for the needs of our neighbors. Let us pray. O oh God, show your church where repentance is needed and lead us in showing compassion to others and in listening to them. Help us in extending hands of reconciliation and care, especially in re relationships with other Christians and people of other faiths. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Help us to see your miracles, O oh God. Move us to love you even more as we behold the wonders of your creation. Renew the seas and the soil, the forests and the creatures living in them. Turn us to do what we can to show our love for your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Inspire us to lead rightly and justly, O oh God. Guide judges and legislatures, police and government officials to create and uphold just laws. Move us to treat all people with dignity and guide our conversations with one another. Lord, in your mercy. Help us to comfort all those who suffer, O Lord. Bring relief to any who are harmed by the wicked acts of others. Bring peace and healing to all who are vulnerable, frightened, despairing, or sick. Especially this day, we pray for Janet, Mariana, Frank, the Badgent family, Kate, Sherry, Pat, Patsy, Linda, Nancy, all those who are on our prayer list, and all those we name before you now, either aloud or in our hearts. Keep them in your care, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Encourage your people to perform their work as though working for you. We pray for those who are considering new employment opportunities. In all of our many job callings, teach us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be our hope for the future, O oh God. We remember with thanksgiving your people who died in faith, especially Barbara, John, and Joyce. May their trust in your promises 
be our inspiration for hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these prayers and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of peace with your neighbors as you're comfortable, and then you may be seated. Stand as you're able. Let us pray. God of power and God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring a portion of the gifts that you have given us to your altar, O Lord, so that we may assist in feeding 
and caring for the people of the world. Help us to show that we belong to the body of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was handed over, our Lord took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these, your own gifts of bread and wine so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
please stand as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have partaken of the body and blood of your Son, Christ Jesus, who is the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by these gifts, send us to gather the world to your banquet table, where all are welcome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A reminder, if you need a Bible, please feel free to take one. The red ones are the regular NRSV, um, so feel free to take that. And after the sermon, there are also lovely small catechisms there. So if you would like to be um, refreshed in your understanding of the catechism, please take one of those as well. As a people of God, we're called to grow in faith, share the good news, all those things. This is the way, one of the ways that we do that. So please take those with you. I'm also to remind you that at the end of your pews and also along um, the windows, there are copies of the beacon. So again, if you want to take a copy with you or take one for someone else, please go ahead and do so. And that, thank you for everyone who stayed and uh, made the dedication of the garden possible. It was very lovely. Thank you so much. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing together hymn number 557. 557. The worship has ended. Now the service begins. As we go out into the world, let us remember our mission. As a people of God, we share Christ's love, grow in faith, and serve others. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.